please join me in welcoming the president of AFLAC US and the incoming 2021 chair of the Georgia Chamber, Ms. Teresa White. As 2021 chair-elect of the Georgia Chamber, I wanna thank all of you for being here today. You know, the Power of Partnership offers tremendous opportunity to produce quality virtual programming during a time when social distancing is necessary and a good example to set for all. These supporters provide us resources to better serve more companies and communities around the state. Please join me in thanking these Georgia companies for their support. Our presenting sponsor, AT&T. Our platinum sponsors, Atlanta Gas Light, Georgia EMC, Georgia Power Company, Google, Greater Macon Chamber of Commerce, and Lucky and Company. Our gold sponsors, the Coca-Cola Company, Delta Airlines, Denton's, Kilpatrick, Townsend, and Stockton, Coke Industries, Lockheed Martin, MEAG Power, Regions Bank, State Farm Insurance Companies, Switch, Synovus, UPS, Wells Fargo, and Wellstar Health System. Our official car, Kia Motors. The official moving company, Suddeth Relocation Systems of A Atlanta. And thank you to all of our silver supporting exhibitor and community sponsors. This year, with the onset of COVID-19, an unimaginable crisis impacted a global economy in micro and macro proportions. The Georgia Chamber pivoted and embarked on a resiliency and recovery initiative to lead Georgia businesses through this crisis into a more stable position. The goal of this initiative is to research, learn, and identify trends and actions that can safely lead us all into a better future, one less vulnerable and more resilient as the effort is so aptly named. I wanna thank all of those business, education, and government leaders who serve on this task force and are dedicated to a new Georgia economy of the future. It is my privilege to co-chair this committee together with my colleagues, former chairman, Sonny Derriso, and chair-elect for 2022, Ben Tarbutton. We appreciate everyone's service in this effort. As we continue to focus on recovery and a more resilient economy, it's a pleasure to welcome to the conversation U.S. Congressman Drew Ferguson and Sanford Bishop. Now, Chris and I are excited today to be joined by two friends in the Georgia delegation, Congressman Sanford Bishop of the 2nd Congressional District of Georgia and Congressman Drew Ferguson of the 3rd Congressional District in Georgia. Gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Now, let's jump in and start talking economic recovery. So I'll start with the first question to Congressman Ferguson. The Paycheck Protection Program, it was passed as part of the CARES Act, uh, helping small businesses, especially during this period of time. How has this program helped small businesses in your district and across America? One of our great concerns in doing what we knew we had to do, which is to tell Americans to stay home and American businesses to close, we knew that there was going to be great disruption in the employment of, of people. And so we felt like it was very important to make sure that businesses stayed connected to their employees and that those employees had the resources that they needed to continue to live their lives and to get to a point so that when we began our recovery, that there would be a structure and a framework to come back to and making sure that businesses could access those employees quickly was very important. Um, in the state of Georgia, I would, you know, it, it has been incredibly impactful. And I have business after business mm -hmm. after business tell me if it had not been for the Paycheck Prote Protection Program, they would have closed. Nationwide, we've estimated that we've saved almost 50 million jobs with that, probably a little over a million and a half right here in Georgia. Um, and it's also given our states additional revenue that they need that they were going to see shortfalls from. Yeah. You know, keep in mind not only the uh, Paycheck Protection Plan, 
but also the en enhanced unemployment insurance that, that was passed. Um, or additional revenues that are coming into the state. I think Georgia businesses received over $14 billion worth of PPP loans, and that's in a huge infusion of capital Absolutely. coming into our state to keep this state economically competitive, but most importantly, to make sure that Georgia families had the resources they need to stay healthy, productive, and be able to get back to work. Excellent, excellent. So, Congressman Bishop, let, let's switch. That's kind of where we've been, right? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about where we're going. I mean, we were, I think we were all very upset when we saw the July 3rd U.S. GDP numbers that had dropped by 9.5 percent, which is really on par with what we saw in the Great Depression. And so can you give us an update on where we are today on what else Congress can do to help? Well, I think that was an article in the New York Times on yesterday where a Chicago University of Chicago economist uh, indicated, uh, which something is very, very worth quoting. He said, the best way to fix the economy is to control the virus. Mm -hmm. And right now, the virus is not under control. It's uh, expanding uh, exponentially. Uh, and of course, the cases across the country are impacting so many, many uh, individuals in all of the states. And uh, to that extent, it means that it's making it more difficult and making it more a uh, scary for people to really go back to, uh, to the economy and to, to go back to their normal lives. Uh, so uh, one of the first things that we've got to do is we've got to get control of the virus. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, what uh, Congress has done in the House, uh, we passed uh, the HEROES Act back in May uh, and sent it to the Senate where it's just been sitting uh, for weeks and weeks and weeks uh, because the senators were just not sure that uh, we needed to do anything just yet. Uh, but that included testing and uh, tracing and uh, uh, contact tracing and uh, uh, isolation and, of course, uh, treatment. And, of course, there were provisions in that bill to make sure that all of that happened so that when people uh, were able to go back to work uh, that they wouldn't be worried about contracting the, the disease on the job uh, or taking it back home to their families. Uh, the HEROES Act was pretty broad. Uh, it was the fifth piece of legislation uh, that we passed in response to uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, and, of course, uh, it was designed to try to fill the gaps uh, that had become apparent uh, through the other four uh, that, that had not been covered. Uh, and one of them, of course, uh, uh, was uh, we needed to honor our heroes, and we called it the Heroes Act. Uh, our state and local government uh, personnel, uh, the people who were on the front lines mm -hmm. of, uh, of helping fight the, uh, the pandemic, and, of course, uh, the state governments, the local governments, uh, the first responders, uh, this was not uh, budget. It was not planned for. So uh, it means that they had to expend funds that uh, they did not expect to have to spend. And it also means that uh, with the economy having to shut down with social distancing because of, of COVID-19, uh, that uh, um, the revenues that our state and our local governments would have uh, to boost their economy and to support uh, the resources they needed to keep uh, providing uh, the services to the people across the country, uh, those resources are, are becoming scarce. And uh, at, they're at a point now where uh, they're having to consider uh, cutting their budgets, laying people off, uh, that's police, fire, uh, public works people who, who pick up the trash, keep our, our streets safe. Uh, you've got the... Uh, uh, those kinds of workers, uh, uh, we just can't afford uh, for them not to be there to deliver the services. And of course, uh, in the HEROES Act, we put provisions in there for that. Uh, that was a tr uh, about a uh, uh, trillion dollars. Uh, for almost uh, for state and local governments uh, and territorial governments so that they would have the resources to do that and they would get uh, replaced with the revenues that they had lost that they had to expend. Uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, honoring the heroes, we wanted to set up a heroes uh, fund, a trust fund really uh, for essential workers. Uh, $200 billion was being set aside in the uh, Heroes Act uh, for hazard pay. 
uh, for those people who are frontline workers, mm -hmm. our healthcare workers, uh, who have to treat people, uh, the, the first responders like the police and the fire and the em emergency uh, uh, medical personnel who have to come in contact with people, uh, they expose themselves to great risk to protect the rest of us. And of course, they have the risk of carrying the virus, contracting it, taking it back to their families. Right. So that's a, a, a serious uh, uh, concern. And of course, we wanted to uh, make provisions after hearing from people all across the country, we wanted to make provisions for that. Also, uh, uh, direct payments. Uh, people at home, they're out of work. Uh, there are some people who uh, were eligible and were getting the uh, unemployment uh, and of course uh, the extended unemployment of six hundred dollars uh, extra uh, was very very helpful because people who were at home uh, not get not not being able to work uh, they still have their mortgage payments they still have their rent payments uh, and they still have to uh, put food on the table for their families and of course when families are staying home uh, they're consuming more food, um, more utilities, more energy, and of course uh, that's a that's a, that's a, a real real uh, concern. And we also wanted to be concerned so that when workers went back, that the workplace would be safe. So there were worker safety provisions put in requiring OSHA to set standards uh, for uh, employers and for workplaces uh, so that uh, when, uh, when uh, uh, workers went back to work, they wouldn't have to worry about contracting the virus and taking it back home. And of course, uh, uh, being out of work and at home, they're concerned about maintaining their health coverage. So there were provisions put in the HEROES Act uh, to make sure that uh, health care coverage could be retained, uh, the, the, uh, uh, also to make sure that uh, there was an extended enrollment period under the ACA so that uh, people could continue to uh, uh, have their health insurance. And then of course, I mentioned the extended unemployment benefits and how important that is. Uh, that was an article I read uh, on yesterday uh, that indicated that the, uh, the $600 per week in extended unemployment, which uh, it, uh, is such a tremendous boost to keep the economy going, uh, and that uh, if it is taken away, which it expired on Friday, uh, it means that uh, uh, if that drops out of the economy, that 600 extended, uh, they compared it to the depression of, uh, of, of the 1920s, uh, where there the, the drop in the economy was like 2.9%, uh, this would be like 4% 4, 4 plus. Uh, so uh, it's very, very important that the extended unemployment uh, be continued as well as the families, the, the payments to families. Uh, the $1,200 and uh, the, the HEROES Act actually provided up to $6,000 uh, per family uh, for total. Uh, so these are, are things that, that are very, very, very important uh, that should be included uh, in the next piece of legislation. Uh, however, uh, what I'm hearing is that uh, uh, they are very far apart. The Senate did not even uh, consider taking up the House bill, the HEROES Act, and uh, it was a very, very uh, ambitious uh, $3 trillion package. And of course, the senators are now considering uh, taking up a package uh, that will not include all of the aspects that the House put in its bill, which, which uh, is causing some, some consternation, uh, which is probably more like uh, a one between one and, and $2 uh, trillion, uh, which means that they're, they're far apart. Uh, and it's a great deal, uh, a great distance away from what the American people actually need. Well, you are extremely passionate about it, certainly. So thank you uh, for that. And so at this point, debate very far apart. How do you think, I mean, how do you see it progressing? Well, um, I hope that we will hear some progress report this afternoon, uh, today. Uh, the, what we expect is that um, uh, the pressure from our state and our local governments uh, who, need, who desperately need the help, uh, the, 
pressure that is placed upon the families uh, who are having now having uh, the unemployment uh, expire uh, and having uh, now having to depend on the uh, other programs like SNAP, the nutrition programs, uh, the TFAP program, which uh, uh, funds and supports the food <coughs> banks. Uh, our food banks all across the country have been overwhelmed. And of course, it, we, through the CARES Act, uh, the first four bills, as well as uh, in the HEROES Act, we are trying to enhance that so that people will at least be able to get, uh, get food to eat and keep food on the table. And of course, in the HEROES Act was also some provisions for housing. Uh, people can't pay their mortgages, can't pay their rent. Landlords who have mortgages on their multifamily uh, uh, rental property uh, can't make their mortgage payments. And so we put provisions in that uh, $3 trillion package to help all of those. Uh, there were forbearances that were put on, the, uh, on, on foreclosures and uh, on uh, evictions, uh, which uh, have begun to expire. Uh, so uh, we're at a very, very serious crisis stage. Congress needs to act. Uh, the American people need us to act. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, we will have uh, just suffering upon suffering upon suffering. And people are suffering now but it's going to be uh, dramatically worse if Congress does not uh, come together uh, and do something uh, to help. Teresa, let me, let me throw something in, in, into this conversation as well, and I think it's important to remember um, that, that as our economy reopens and we're beginning to look at job numbers and we're beginning to see more and more people go back into the workforce, um, I think it's important that we, that, that we don't incentivize people to sit on the sidelines. Okay, um, I don't think that most Americans uh, would agree that, that paying people more to stay at home than they were actually making on their paycheck is, is, is an incentive to go to work. I know throughout the third district of Georgia, and I'm sure that it's that, that mm -hmm. is true throughout Sanford's district as well, that there are companies that have literally hundreds, if not thousands, of jobs, and almost every business that I talk to says that their limiting factor right now um, is the employees coming back, not because of fear, but because they're making more on un on enhanced unemployment than they are at re-entering the workforce, and that's something that we've got to address. There's no de there's no debate about the fact that the most vulnerable among us, we have to be there to take care of them. I think there's genuine commitment. But I think it's also important that we incentivize people to return to work, that we incentivize a pro-growth economy, that we return the dignity of work to people. And we make sure that they're able to go back in a sensible, safe way to begin to rebuild, renew, and restore their American dreams. Keep in mind, there's almost a half a trillion dollars that has not been spent yet out of the, out of the CARES package. Half a trillion dollars of appropriated dollars. Mm. Almost $100 billion went to states, and m most of that money has yet to be dispersed through state government. For example, I think in the state of Michigan, less than 10% of the dollars that were appropriated to the state of Michigan have gone out. Not all of the dollars have gone out here in the state of Georgia. We should be thinking about things that make the dollars that have been already appropriated more flexible, allowing governors to use those dollars to go to school systems so that children can safely go back to schools, making sure that the resources that are there with the dollars that are already existing. Also recognizing that there's a half a trillion dollars that has not been spent that the Fed can access to stand up credit facilities to make sure that businesses have the long term liquidity that they need to get through these crises, to make sure that, that developers of housing don't get caught in a housing crunch. So I think we need to be cautious about moving forward, not be blind, not say that we're not going to do it, but let's be smart with the dollars that have already been appropriated. Let's find ways to incentivize growth. Let's find ways to, to bring manufacturing back here to the U.S. And I think that that's something that we can do. We can reopen safely, sensibly. We can begin to re-educate our children. And there are a lot of resources out there that we need to focus on spending first. And then as our economy rebounds, Let's look at those areas that may need help in the future. Well, let me just, just say that uh, that that's a challenge. It is um, a challenge. And uh, no one really wants to stay at home and not go back to work unless they have to. Uh, and yes, uh, there are certain instances where people may uh, be benefiting uh, by the enhanced unemployment. However, uh, there are millions of people who want to go back to work 
but are afraid to go back to work because they don't want to contract the virus. They yeah. may be in a, a, a risky situation themselves, health-wise, uh, and they don't want to take it back to their families. Uh, they're afraid about their children going back to school. Uh, it's clear across the country as we are opening schools now that, that the uh, uh, social distancing is not possible in many of the school districts, which means that the parents are worried about their children. Uh, they don't want to send them to, to school and have them come back with the virus and give it to them, nor do they want to go to work, to a workplace that may or may not be safe. Yeah, I so think that what we're trying you, to do yeah. in the Heroes Act mm -hmm. is to make sure that if, when people go back to work, that the workplace is safe, that there are standards against which uh, the, uh, they, right. the workplace can be measured so that people know that, uh, that they're safe, that they're not going infect, to be infected or infect others and take the infection home. Yeah, I think the common thread here is really it, we, we all want everyone to get back to work. We all want everybody to be back yes. safely um, because that's really what's going to drive the economy, making sure that we are get back to work but making sure that we're being back, that we're back safely. The, the, the key, though, is the, the testing, the contact tracing, and uh, the isolation and the treatment, which is not being done. Uh, right now, the cases are developing so fast yeah. that uh, it's impossible for the tracing uh, to take place. And the personnel have not been hired uh, hardly any place in the, in the country, uh, save maybe in New York, uh, sufficient uh, to, to be able to, to, to keep up uh, with the number of new cases. Uh, that means that we are going to have an exponential explosion in the next few weeks, as we are seeing developing now. So we have got to get a handle on the virus. Uh, to fix the economy, we've got we to, to control the virus. The virus. Yeah. And so we've got to do that with testing, tracing, isolation, and treatment. So a lot of what both of you just talked about, and when you talk about the treatment and all, it goes back to our health care system, right? And I know, Congressman, you've had multiple hospital closures in your district, including one just a few weeks ago. Drew, you've got a lot of rural hospitals. And I talked to ACCG last week, who talked about a number of counties in Georgia that are really on the brink of bankruptcy. And if they can't float their own county, it's not going to float the hospital. So I'm curious whether it's the HEROES Act or the legislation we've already passed or what we're talking about. What's out there to help, particularly those rural hospitals? Uh, in, so one, in one, one thing, one thing that we all that we all agreed on in the CARES Act is that we knew that when hospitals were shut down and they were going to lose their revenue streams, that we needed to be there for them. Um, and that was something, you know, it, in, in, in our rural communities, the problems with hospitals um, didn't come about because of COVID, but it certainly right. exacerbated the problem. So again, almost $100 billion has been out there for, for hospitals uh, to stabilize them, to stabilize revenue streams. And, and what, we're, what we were able to do is to provide a bridge. However, we also need to recognize that going forward, that rural hospitals are under a threat um, like, like never before. And it's being driven by the fact that number one, there's a huge disparity between rural Georgia and, and Metro Atlanta but you could say that about every single state, uh, every single state in every rural community versus, versus a metropolitan area. And look, Sanford and I both represent districts that have very, very large rural areas and the systemic poverty that exists there because of the lack of opportunity for a variety of reasons hurts, hurts families at every point, whether it's with their job, but, most, but one of the things that we've seen um, in, in recent years and now even more so is is, is access to health care because of the, the closure of these hospitals. So going forward, I think that we've got to continue to make sure that, that our rural hospitals have a lifeline. It's too important not to do it. But I think we've got to be really smart about reviving the economies in rural Georgia. And I think, I think there's some great new ideas that are out there that allow, economy, that allow rural communities to once again thrive, be centers of prosperity, allow families to stay together, allow there to be a, a retention of capital and, and, and human capital, not only as well as financial capital in, the, in these communities. Um, so for a hospital to succeed, um, it's got to make sure that it's got the revenue streams and a local healthy economy is part of that, that equation. It doesn't solve all problems, but look, when, when, when people live in systemic poverty in rural Georgia, it, it, makes, it, it makes providing health care there very difficult. But I think it's something that we're all committed to solving. 
And one, one of the things that's in the HEROES Act, uh, allocations of resources to make sure that our county health departments uh, are able to do uh, better than they have been in, in delivering health services to people all across uh, uh, our state and across the country. Uh, if the, the coronavirus has taught us anything, it has really lifted the cover off of the deficiencies in our infrastructure, in our health care infra infrastructure, and in our health care delivery system. Uh, and that, of course, uh, uh, has, has really uh, uh, come forth because the lack of, of health care services uh, in the state of Georgia, for example, uh, has created uh, circumstances to make vulnerable populations. Uh, and they're vulnerable because they have pre-existing conditions, uh, obesity, uh, high blood pressure, uh, cancer, uh, immuno, uh, immunization, immu, immune deficiencies in the immune system. Yeah. Uh, uh, I could go on and on, but uh, those conditions are prevalent because they have not had primary care in the areas, particularly right. in our rural areas, and some of, some of our urban centers as well. And so that means that certain populations have been extremely vulnerable. Uh, particularly African Americans and other minorities, and the, the death rate uh, among that population, that segment, that de demographic, uh, has, has been uh, extremely high. And that uh, is an indication of the deficiencies in our health care infrastructure and our health care delivery system in the greatest country on the face of the earth. Oh, gonna... uh, we've got to do something about that, and, and I think uh, the HEROES Act is a, is a beginning it's... for that. Uh, but uh, we've got to focus on that as well as our other infrastructure, including transportation. Well, we could talk about this issue all day. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to switch gears on you. Okay. Um, I'm going to stay in the rural communities. Um, tell, tell me, as the rural communities are trying to, uh, and the businesses in those communities are trying to move through this uh, global pandemic, Tell me what other issues, and I'll start with you, um, uh, Congressman Ferguson, what other issues have come up that you've seen kind of surface in those rural communities? Broadband is one that I hear about a lot, and I just wondered so, if that's... So broadband, broadband has to be the focus of almost every conversation every in rural mm -hmm. communities. And mm -hmm. it, is, it is, is like having a community without electricity if you don't have access to broadband. Can you imagine starting a business in a rural community that doesn't have access to broadband. Um, no. We cannot solve the health care crisis in rural, in rural Georgia without broadband, okay? And what we've seen, and one of the things that we haven't talked about today that was in the CARES Act, is something that's very good, is we, is we made available telehealth. Mm -hmm. And I think we're, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do on the Ways and Means Committee is to make those provisions permanent. Because it is really mm -hmm. difficult for a family in, in rural Georgia to, to drive 40 to 50 miles for every single doctor's appointment when in fact you could do some of that remotely. But you can't do it remotely if you don't have broadband. The other big issue that we've seen and, and that is emerging very quickly is the disparity between learning in rural communities where there's no broadband and lear learning in suburban communities where there is. I want you to mm -hmm. think about what we do in normal times. We talk about education almost as if it's a religion in, in this state. And we've told generation after generation because we believe it and we know it to be true that advancing yourself through education is very important and it's the key to success. And we think enough of it that every single day under normal terms, uh, under normal times, we send a yellow school bus to every household to pick up a child and bring that child to school. But here's the problem that we've got right now. We are now saying because of COVID and because of school closures that we're gonna do learning remotely. As we do learning remotely, there are areas and their families that don't have access to broadband. Mm -hmm. Forget broadband. I have parts of my district, as Sanford does, yes. that don't have even a cell phone signal. Okay? Yeah. So in essence, what we're doing is we're not sending the school bus to pick up the kid every single day. Mm -hmm. And it's not fair that, that, that families in rural communities are having to make decisions mm -hmm. about education, health, and safety, um, and they, they don't have those opportunities. If we did this at any other time, I guarantee you every Republican and Democrat in the House and in, in Congress would melt the dome off of the Capitol fighting this. But yet, here's where we are. And the, the fact is we just wiped half a year's worth of education off the books in, 20, in, in 2020, 
and we look like we're going to do something very different in going, going into this next year. And so what I have great concerns about are number one, those kids that do have access that are having to learn remotely right now, what's that experience going to be like? Are the eighth graders that are now going into high school, are they going to be prepared? Are the seniors, juniors and seniors that are going into college and going and, and going in and, and utilizing our technical college system, are they going to be prepared? Mm -hmm. We don't know because we've just missed half a year's worth of education. And then you look at the disparity of the children that both Sanford and I have the, have the honor of representing that simply are not going to have access or they're going to have to make a choice between their health and their education. And that's not fair. And so therefore, what we have to do is do things like, we, like do what we, we've been focused on, which is introducing legislation last week called the CAN Act, Connect America Now, that begins to look at why broadband has not been deployed in certain areas, overcoming the economic viability gaps. And what I did is I put my hat on, I looked at it as a local mayor. If this, if this were a water line or a sewer line, how would I get it done? Looking at the timeline of money, access to capital, thing, using patient capital as opposed to subsidizing the return on investment for short-term capital. Looking at being able to, to create economies of, sale, of, uh, of scale by making sure that, that rural telephone companies can, can band together through purchases. There are a lot of things that we can do, making available investment tax credits and expanding the use of private activity bonds designated for rural areas. Continuing to do those kinds of things open up economic opportunity for rural Georgia. And something that's happening right here in this building, you know, the, I think you mentioned that uh, about 80% of your workforce now, and I may be off on that number, is now working remotely. Yeah. Think about the competitive advantage of being able, if you're a community, to being able to to have to have people working remotely. Yeah, yeah um, no, it's, you're, it's, you're it, absolutely right. It, it's something that is very unique there. Yeah. And if our state begins to think very competitively about how investment, uh, how job tax credits are applied, then we can become we can become a center for the rest of the country for for, for to put more Georgians to work. We both believe in the talent that exists in rural Georgia, Absolutely. but they've got to have access. And I'll tell you what, if, I, if companies are able, if you can tie those job tax credits to where that person lives, then their quality of life in rural communities is going to be higher. The communities are going to be healthier. And everything that we've talked about with education and health care, agriculture, you go down the list, those problems can be solved in rural Georgia because there's great economic opportunity. Let me jump in and say that uh, one of the reasons that I sought, I've been on the Appropriations Committee now for um, more than a decade, uh, but I've tried to position myself to be on uh, uh, subcommittees on the appropriations to bring resources that are, are really beneficial for our state. Agriculture is the number one industry in the state. Defense is the second highest, and financial services is the third uh, biggest contributor to our, our Georgia economy. But uh, on the, as I chair the Agriculture Subcommittee of Appropriation, uh, we fund uh, all of the, the farm service agency uh, proposals, but we do rural development. And uh, in that capacity, we've put, uh, as, as chair of the uh, Subcommittee of Appropriations in our Appropriations Bill, we've put over $19 billion in rural broadband and broadband and of course uh, in the CARES Act uh, we put broadband in and in our most recent appropriations uh, we've got another billion dollars uh, for rural broadband for connectivity the reconnect program because everybody agrees that we have got to connect every place in America. So if everybody that is, agrees then what's that last step that needs to be taken to it, 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 is remo it is removing the, the financial inequality that exists in rural America. And by that I mean you have to recognize that when you have smaller populations that are more dispersed, you can't use the same models that you use for urban or suburban areas. You have to have a longer timeline of money. You have to, you have to, you ha you have to look at things differently where you close economic viability gaps, where you're able to build economies of scale in a different way. Those are the reasons that broadband has not been deployed. Look, Sanford's right. We, you know, there's a role for Congress to play in this in terms of appropriations, but there's also a role for us to play on the Ways and Means Committee to remove the tax barriers that make this 
that make this really almost impossible in many of our rural areas. We have got to make sure, and I think it's a government function simply because uh, people in rural America need to have the same opportunities to realize that potential as people any place else in the country, in the world. So in rural Georgia, people should have the same opportunities and we should make that possible regardless of whether it's uh, an economic uh, uh, attraction for, for business. Uh, as, as a necessity for, for life and for prosperity uh, in the rest of our state, out state as we call it, in rural Georgia, uh, government, a combination of state government resources and federal resources need to be there when the private sector is, is a little reluctant to invest. Uh, we need to step in at that point to make it feasible because the people should not have to suffer because it's not economically feasible uh, for a business to invest in broadband. But broadband is a necessity, uh, whether it's for health care, whether it's for distance learning for our education system, whether it's for the connectivity for business, for marketing. Uh, all of that is essential. And if, if, if our rural communities are going to survive, uh, we are going to have to go beyond the, 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 the attractive uh, tax incentives. Uh, we're going to have to do uh, some actual government funding just as we fund roads. Mm -hmm. uh, roads uh, is a part of our, the roads and bridges are part of our infrastructure, but uh, uh, internet and broadband should be a part of our infrastructure. No child or no family should ever not be able to realize that potential simply because of the zip code that they live in. And I do want to give credit. I mean, it, you've, you've got the Georgia General Assembly have, have tried over the last several years. They've passed some bills. You've had Comcast recently went out in some rural areas. AT&T has made some significant investments in rural communities. And our EMCs, which is the, the public-private yeah. partnership now, Absolutely. have the ability. But I think what we've heard from and all of them... we did that through the rural development. Exactly. Uh, the, 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 provision the, where's the, the... Right. Where's the, the federal guidance and the bigger picture? That's Those are, you know, strategic investments, but what's the bigger one? So... I want to, both of you mentioned your committees, and I want to go back to that if I can for a minute. So, Drew, you're on, on Ways and Means. Tell us, let's talk a minute about what else Ways and Means is working on right now in regards to the pandemic and the recovery. And then, Congressman Bishop, I want to ask you about additional work on the, the Appropriations Committee. Yeah, so, you know, I, th I think one of the things that we've learned in all of this is that America no longer needs to be dependent on other countries to supply us with the things that we need that, that are absolutely necessary. Our medicines, our, our medical equipment, um, our basic supplies. And so a lot of the conversation that we're looking at on ways and means right now is how do we, how do we make sure that America is the best place in the world and the most competitive place in the world to make those products? Um, and I think that, that that's been a focus. Whether that is through the tax code, whether it is um, continue, continuing to advance pro-growth policies that create jobs here in the U.S., or whether it's, whether it's looking at the trade environment that, that, that says that we need to be trading with partners that treat us fairly, and we need to look quite candidly at the, at the malfeasance uh, of China in this and how they have, they, they quite candidly have taken advantage of Americans. We should never allow ourselves to be in that position again. Um, so making sure that we can produce medicines here, um, whether it's antibiotics, whether it's drugs um, of, of any type, making sure that we can manufacture our basic supplies here. And I think one of the things that we're very focused on in the bill that, that, that I'm very supportive of, um, matter of fact, I'm an original co-sponsor on it, is one that, that incentivizes the onshoring of intellectual property. Okay? America is the most innovative country in the world. We have the most unique system that allows for opportunity, for failure, and then rebirth and, and, and success. Um, it doesn't exist anywhere else in the world, and our freedom is in our thoughts um, are what the world needs right now. And so making sure that, that, that the things that, that we're able to do here, our intellectual property, our gifts of, of creativity um, are protected here, I think is vitally important. If you look at the work that's being done right now on Operation Warp Speed, which is, which is the administration's effort to get therapeutics and vaccines to the market in record time, it's a partnership between the NIH, the CDC, the FDA, and American pharmaceutical companies. And we stand on the verge of doing something we've never done before, which is number one, having a vaccine for any type of coronavirus, okay? Remember, we still don't have vaccines for SARS, okay? This, 
this is a huge step. And we've done that because we have not done, it's, it's not that we've skipped steps, but we've compressed the process and we brought in partners and it's a true public-private partnership between, between the federal government and the American pharmaceutical industry. And what that's gonna be able to do is allow us when the vaccine is tested, and many of these now are in phase three, three of testing going into phase four, as these things come onto market, we have made strategic investments in the infrastructure needed to produce the vaccines quickly and safely and the therapeutics that are coming on board as well. We gotta make sure that those are available and affordable and accessible by the American people. And if all of that happens, then that will be one of the greatest achievements that this country has, has done for mankind is being able to figure out how to defeat a pandemic in, in less than a year. That's pretty amazing. What we've got to, and he touched on uh, affordability. Um, you know, America is the greatest country in the world, but our challenge is to make America's greatness be shared by all of its citizens so that that greatness is affordable and accessible to all of its citizens. And when we develop this vaccine, uh, we got to make sure that it's accessible and affordable to everybody. Uh, the people who are most vulnerable are the least able to pay for high-cost drugs. And so we've got to really work on our health care system uh, to make sure that it is affordable, that our prescription drugs and our vaccines are, are accessible and affordable to, to everybody who needs them. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's for naught. Um, as far as the uh, Appropriations Committee, um, we have passed uh, through the House uh, 10 of the 12 appropriations bills that are in the Senate. Uh, we have two, the legislative branch and Homeland Security that have not been sent to the Senate, that have not passed the House floor. Uh, but that's the bulk of the funding for the American government. In the agriculture bill, for example, uh, uh, we do uh, the farm service agents to make sure that people can eat. Uh, we produce the highest quality, the safest, the most abundant food and fiber anywhere in the uh, uh, industrialized world. And, uh, but we've realized, as a result of this pandemic, uh, that we can have some hiccups in our supply chain yes. uh, with uh, a pandemic like we've experienced. So we've got to correct that and we've got to work with that. But uh, fortunately, uh, agriculture producers, uh, and Georgia's a big part of that, uh, uh, have the resources and we're in the process of doing that in our appropriations bill. We're making sure that that is working. We've also tried to make sure that we have adequate resources for our nutrition programs, our school lunch program, our WIC program, our, our SNAP program, uh, and our food banks, mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that as we go through this pandemic that people who need food can get access to it, the food pantries. And of course, uh, uh, we've got to make sure that uh, our transportation system is working, uh, and we've got to make sure that uh, uh, in our appropriations process that we Make, that, make sure that to, to get the economy working again, uh, the means of transportation, particularly in our urban areas where there's public transportation, uh, where we have our airlines that have been severely impacted, uh, that they are safe and that they're able to get the resources to put them back uh, in business so that people can safely travel to and from and, and our economy can, can work. Uh, but uh, having passed uh, our bills, uh, the Senate has not taken up any of them. We sent them over at the end of July. Uh, and from what I'm hearing, it's not likely uh, that the Senate is going to actually go through the, what we call regular order through the appropriation subcommittees to pass their bills, uh, but rather they will uh, write a bill and uh, then compare that and uh, conference with the House based upon uh, the bill that they've written. Um, that, but has not passed uh, in committee or has not passed uh, on the floor of the Senate. Uh, so I expect that uh, at the end of the year, uh, we will have a continuing resolution. And given the political situation, uh, I'm not sure if uh, the two sides will be able to agree uh, on a final appropriations bill. Uh, hopefully, we would be able to do that, but uh, the likelihood uh, may not be that great. Uh, so we may be experiencing a continuing resolution uh, through the lame, lame duck session and even possibly uh, into the next, uh, uh, next year, uh, the next administration. Well, I'm going to switch gears a little bit, okay? okay. And um, I know we, we've had some really good discussion here. 
but we would be totally remiss if we did not talk about the legacy of John Lewis uh, during this period of time. And I know you all both um, are a part of that legacy, and I'd love to hear uh, a John Lewis story from each of you. I'll start with you, Drew. Well, first of all, I, I, our country is better for the sacrifice that, that John Lewis made throughout his life to make sure that Americans had the right to vote. And he's someone that always fought for equality. Um, and John was one that, um, that was passionate about you know, where he stood, what he believed in. And John and I disagreed on, on many things, but he always did it in a respectful way. And I think John deep down believed that, um, that freedom was important for every single person. Um, I believe that he, that, that he believed in individual freedom and individual creativity. But probably the, one of the most memorable moments that I've had in Congress is a night uh, during my freshman term when uh, Congressman Lewis asked the Georgia delegation to come to his house. And he fed us dinner. Sanford, I tell you, it was a remarkable evening mm -hmm. to have John recount his life, the early years, the struggles, the civil rights movement, and his thoughts today. And to have a legend of the civil rights movement, really two sitting at the table, because many people don't know or don't really have a full appreciation for the work that Congressman Bishop did in the early days as well. But it was almost a surreal experience to sit there as a freshman member of Congress and have that. And I'm struck, I was always struck by John's passion for the issue um, and, and his ability to recount the story in a way that was very captivating. And again, as we, 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 again, John, you could, you could disagree with John on issues, but it's always a respectful manner. Right, right. I, I, um, I've known John for 52 years. Uh, I met John uh, shortly after the assassination of Dr. King. I was a, a first-year law student uh, at Emory Law School, and I took a job after school as an archivist at the beginning Martin Luther King Center for Social Change that was started at the basement of the Interdenominational Theological Center in the AU Center uh, in Atlanta. Uh, and uh, John Lewis, uh, as a SNCC person, uh, Stokely Carmichael, H. Rap Brown, uh, would come through. Uh, and I was clipping news articles about Dr. King and archiving them, uh, but I got to meet John at that point. Shortly after that, John uh, took over the uh, voter education project. Uh, John was passionate. Uh, of course, he, he was the hero uh, of the Edmund Pettus Bridge in the march, which led to the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and of course, John uh, headed the voter education project to register people across the South uh, who had been uh, denied the right to vote, but who had had that right uh, given by the, the uh, Voting Rights Act. And of course, uh, I was elected to the General Assembly uh, in 1976, and of course, John uh, served on the City Council in Atlanta. So we got to, uh, paths crossed again, and we got to work with each other uh, as he was uh, pushing uh, uh, legislation that would benefit uh, the city of Atlanta uh, and his, his uh, council district. And of course, uh, then uh, I had the great fortune of being to serve almost 28 years with John in Congress. Uh, John uh, has such respect for people all across the world in our delegation, uh, in our state. Uh, both John and I are from Alabama, and he used to always <laughs> remind me, he said, Sanford, uh, Alabama named us, but Georgia claimed us. <laughs> and of course, uh, uh, I enjoyed uh, visiting his boyhood home in Troy, where he pointed out the place where he preached to the chickens. Uh, but it's exceptionally, uh, uh, it, was, it was just really remarkable uh, as we flew back and forth uh, from Washington to Atlanta or Atlanta to Washington, often on the same flights. When we get off the flight, we'd be walking down the corridor together, uh, going to the parking lot, and uh, it would take twice as long uh, for me if I were walking with John because people would stop John. Uh, he was so oh, meet Congressman Bishop and uh, he would sign autographs, yes. he would take pictures, uh, and he was so 
humble and his humility just exuded. Yes. And uh, he spoke to every one of the workers uh, as well as the, the travelers who would recognize him and want to carry on a conversation. Yeah. So uh, John's <laughs> life really uh, uh, stands for uh, a real true commitment and a sacrifice for justice, for peace, for love, uh, an opportunity and fairness for everyone. And of course, uh, his legacy uh, should be our commitment to making the Voting Rights uh, Act that is now pending in Congress uh, law. Uh, of course, we intend to name it the John uh, Lewis Voting Rights Act. Uh, and of course, uh, our delegation uh, on the day of the funeral um, we were uh, almost unanimous. The majority of our delegation uh, sent a letter to uh, Governor Kemp, uh, to Speaker Ralston, and uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Duncan, uh, asking that the legislature consider uh, replacing the statue uh, in Statuary Hall where we, uh, each state has two, two statues, uh, uh, putting the one of, of uh, replacing the one of Alexander Hamilton Stevens, uh, who was the Vice President of the Confederacy, with a statue of John Lewis. Uh, I think 10 of our 16-member uh, delegation uh, signed on to that letter. Uh, uh, apparently, uh, 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 Governor Kemp uh, thinks it's a good idea. I've heard uh, very positive comments from Speaker Ralston as well as uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Duncan. So I, I, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do that because the legacy of John Lewis uh, will reflect with that statue, with the thousands of people that come through and view the Capitol and Statuary Hall every year, it will reflect our past, it will reflect our present, uh, with the struggles we have, but the hope that we'll have for the future. And that was the kind of life uh, that John Lewis le lived, and it was, it's the legacy that he has left us, the challenge that he has left us, to follow and emulate uh, his life. I'll so so is a state, word. yeah, is, is a state that was home to so many, so many big parts of the civil rights movement and um, home to, to Martin Luther King Jr. and to John Lewis. Um, I mean, Georgians, Georgians should be proud of our history. Um, we should be proud of, of, of overcoming so many things that were wrong in the past that, we, that we've made right today. And I know that Georgia business probably would like to participate in this process as well. And look, I, I, th this is something that the state legislature has control over. But I also think it's important that if the business community uh, feels, you know, you know, feels a sense of duty and wants to contribute to this process, I think that I, th I think that would be I think that would be a good thing. Whether you're a small business or a large business, um, you know, making sure that Georgia continues to honor the legacy of, of John Lewis's work in the voting rights era, I think is important to do. And, and, and there is an opportunity for the private sector to participate. Yeah, it is yeah. a state uh, responsibility. The legislature will be responsible for removing the statue that's there, uh, replacing it, and for uh, getting a new one, a sculpture. They've got to commission a sculpture. Uh, they've got to uh, create a commission. And of course, they've got to raise money to do that, uh, either appropriations or from the private sector. And I'm sure that they will probably open it up so the private sector can participate. Right. And I would urge uh, the Georgia Chamber and all of its members uh, to participate uh, in this great tribute uh, uh, to our country not just to John Lewis, but right. to the, the, the hope uh, for our country uh, through uh, a contribution to, to, to th this effort. I want to uh, get this uh, part in. So um, 2016, uh, Congressional Black Caucus, um, AFLAC honored uh, John Lewis's uh, legacy. And uh, when I met John Lewis, I absolutely um, he was just, as you described him, very just he was over in the corner, he was talking to people, he was helping other people meet, you know, others. <laughs> and I finally said, who, who is he? <laughs> and, and they said, that, that's John Lewis. And I just thought, you know, wow. And I was, you know, young, coming, you know, just arriving at AFLAC at the time. And I just, um, he is a true giant. He um, is. True giant. And really, um, to your point, Drew, everyone respected him. Everyone respected him. And I think he earned that respect. He, he earned it. So 
anyway, that, that was my John Lewis story. So um, I'll turn it back over to Chris. And Chris, you want to take us home here? So I, I just want to thank all of you guys for being with us. Thank you for what you do uh, for us every day in Washington and back in your district, too, and to taking the time today. We're, we hate that this event is not in front of, you know, 1,500 of our best friends. I know yep. you guys miss that uh, interaction as well. But taking the time to let uh, the people of Georgia know what's happening in D.C. and that you're there working for them every day makes a huge difference. So thank you for your time today. Thank you. We thank appreciate you it. Thank you for having us. All right. All right.